Hi everyone, welcome to week four. This week we are talking about the connection between mental health, inequality, and social class. I am tremendously passionate about talking about inequality. I myself am an inequality scholar, which means that I, um, as a scholar, try to sociologically understand what generates and reproduces, right? Keeps inequalities um, functioning, right? Um, what kind of, if you will, generates inequality in a society? And how do different inequalities look in different societies, right? So there are different kind of inequalities in different parts of the world. Um, this week, and in the following weeks, we really will be focusing on the U.S. context and kind of understanding what kind of inequalities exist specific to um, American society and how do those inequalities then intersect with mental health outcomes, mental health treatment, um, and the way that mental health is perceived, defined, and understood among um, its citizens, right? And then also, how does culture factor into that as well? So... Let's go ahead, let's get into it. This week, we're going to focus on a few key concepts, and this will really lay the groundwork for us to better understand and make sense of social class and its connection to mental health, right? So the first concept that I wanna introduce us to is what's known as a social location. Social location is a way of classifying an individual based on categories such as race, social class, gender, sexual orientation, religion, age, size, color, ability status, um, and the list can go on. And so a person's life and choices will be influenced by their social location. Social location can in fact limit your choices. Um, for instance, some groups may have legal rights and privileges that others don't based on group belonging. We can think about this in a historical context. <laughs> That's my cat bash. Um, a historical context um, in which um, women did not have the right to vote or black people did not have the right to vote or were not considered human. And today we can consider this um, in present day context very recently. Um, those who are part of the LGBTQ community did not have the right to be married. And currently, if you are um, an ex-convict, many of your rights, such as being able to vote, being able to get federal aid for school, um, those become denied, right? And so we want to understand how group status or group belonging, such as belonging to a certain race, a certain social class, gender or sexual orientation can limit your legal rights and pr protections um, or possibly enhance, right, and privilege you based on group belonging. And so social location also impacts what you learn and what you're taught about society and vice versa also influences what others have learned and been taught about you. So for example, a consistent finding is that resumes with names that sound African-American actually tend to get called back for interviews much less often than those with white sounding names, even though the resumes were otherwise identical. And so this was an experiment that was done to say, is there institutional bias in, for instance, the employment sector? And what this um, experiment demonstrated is that, yes, in fact, there is. And so this week, what we're going to be really thinking about with this concept of social location is how, like for one, what is our social location? And really starting to think about what, what groups do you belong to, right? Um, are you, what is your race, what is your race, excuse me, your class, your gender, and then how do these categories converge to inform our unique identities? Um, and the next concept we're gonna then talk about is how social location can lead to the marginalization of a group. So if a group is marginalized, it means that it occupies a position outside the centers of power. So for instance, um, those who um, have been diagnosed with a mental illness, um, or even those who have not, in fact, there's very much um, significant stigma um, that is connected to mental health. And so many people have um, been discriminated against because of their mental health status, or they may be afraid to find out a diagnosis because of the stigma that's attached to it, right? And this is also very important to think about when we think about kind of the cultural belief systems that we have about mental illness and how those may differ from one to another. 
So marginalized groups are often racial, ethnic, and in this case, we can talk about ability status, right? And how mental health is a part of ability status, right? And how people with disabilities often are um, in our society categorized as a marginalized group, meaning that they tend to have a clearer view of how power works often because they are on the margins and are not included and closer to that center of power. So speaking of power, this is another one of our concepts. There are many different kinds of power and many different kinds of inequality. So there are the obvious kinds, such as economic power and income inequality or political power and politically enforced inequalities like segregation or slavery. But there's the less obvious kinds, such as social or cultural power and inequality. For example, people who tend to speak with, for instance, a non-standard accent or dialect are often judged harshly for them and can be seen as less intelligent or less mature. And very, and, and in the same vein, I should say, there are similar um, kinds of cultural and social inequalities that are attached to um, having mental health issues, right? And so we really want to think about how does our society kind of make sense of and treat those who are mentally ill, right? Um, even phrases like that's so crazy or that's insane are really interesting social artifacts within our language, right? To examine why do we refer to things as crazy or insane? And are, is that a positive thing, right? What kind of stigma gets attached even within the way that we speak about things? Um, and that kind of, in a, in a way, constructs our reality in the way that we make sense of mental health and mental illness. So now that we've talked about social location, power, and marginalization, the next concept I really want us to, to introduce you to will not only be foundational in thinking about class inequalities this week, but it will also kind of be a bridge as we go from week to week and talk about gender and sexism and race and racism. And it can also be expanded to other categories that we won't unfortunately get to address in this class, though may be very relative to your own lives. And so I really want you to think about um, intersectionality, which is essentially under Understanding that there isn't just one kind of inequality that trumps all the rest, right? And so it's not like, oh, you know what? Sexism is the worst form of inequality. We have to do something about sexism. While other people, are, people excuse me, are like, no, like actually racism is really terrible. And then there's others who are like, um, I'm actually pretty sure xenophobia, which is discrimination and fear of immigrants or those who are different, might say, you know, xenophobia is the top issue that we need to address. Intersectionality takes a little bit of a different approach and says there isn't one um, most significant form of inequality. In fact, they intersect, right? And so we have these overlapping, intersecting, excuse me, forms of inequality that create kind of what is known as like this matrix of domination. And therefore, social justice advocates are often very um, adamant about saying, if we're going to address inequality, let's address it for all people, which... I must admit is <laughs> quite a challenge. But with that said, it's a very effective um, way to think about how do different inequalities map onto other different kinds of inequalities, right? And so as we go through this week and we start to now kind of think about this interconnection between class and mental health, how might gender also kind of mediate those outcomes or race, right? Um, or even where you live. And so we wanna think about the interdimensionality of inequality, specifically when we're thinking about, um, excuse me, mental health outcomes, right? So now we're going to get into one more concept and then we can kind of have a bit of a dialogue. Well, you're not here, but we'll have a dialogue through our forums. <laughs> so the next, um, excuse me, concept would be class stratification. So stratification is essentially a hierarchy that is um, founded on a specific trait in a society. So for instance, ex I'm so sorry, I can't speak. For example, class stratification means that in a given society, the ranks, right? I'm trying to make like a triangle. The ranks are um, based on what social class you fall into. And therefore, 
a number of resources, material and non-material, will be hoarded among the top with less of those resources available to those who are on the bottom of rank, ranks, excuse me, of that stratification system. And so with understanding this, right, that there is a class stratification system in the United States in which we do have less resources available for those who are impoverished or even possibly working class, right, and lower middle class, we really want to examine what are the consequences of this. And so with that said, there are two um, angles, if you will, that I want us to consider and think about this week when we're thinking about inequality, class, and mental health. The first is how does right, that social context of class impact or mediate people's mental health outcomes via the environment? So um, what about social class? will run with the example of poverty because we do know right again there's a spectrum you can be impoverished to extremely wealthy how does that influence one's environment where you live um your living conditions are you living paycheck to paycheck um how are you getting to work are you working um are there other stressful factors within your environment that are um at, um, occurring as a result of your class position. And for those who are impoverished, unfortunately, there are a myriad of factors, many factors environmentally that in a way kind of creates like a, um, a multifaceted, a layered um, context in which there are significantly more stressors, right? And so evictions, homelessness, food insecurity, um, joblessness, just to name a few. And so there are so many social problems connected to poverty. Um, and so what we want to kind of think about from a mental health standpoint are then, or excuse me, is how does this environment actually impact mental health outcomes for people, right? And the second angle we want to then consider is, okay, if the environment, let's just say, is negatively impactful for someone's mental health, what can they do about that? And we also see that those who are impoverished are kind of in a double bind because not only may they have very specific um, stressors that are related to poverty, but they also then are often less resourced. Um, and what I mean by less resource is access to healthcare generally and then quality healthcare on top of that. So what kind of resources are available um, and what kind of co-occurring co disorders may be happening as well? Substance abuse, right, is often um, something that co-occurs with mental health issues and then what kind of resources are available for those who maybe are uninsured or who have state insurance. And so this week, I want us to think about those two kind of angles, right? The conditions, the environment of poverty, or we can run with those who are even wealthy and think how does that environment environment impact mental health? And then we also want to think about how does class impact one's ability to be resourceful and to treat and to respond to mental health. I'm really looking to forward to um, your discussions this week. Um, I just want to wrap up by saying that this class, this topic in general of mental health hits um, home for me, and especially talking about social class. So me and myself being from Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, I have seen a lot of mental health crises. Um, I've seen um, friends, I've seen community members really going through various struggles. Um, sometimes it's visible, and that's what's also kind of challenging is sometimes it's not, right? And how does the community make sense of these things? How does the community to respond to mental health issues? What are people doing to get by and to make it through? And um, what do we as a society need to do to address this issue? That's a question I want to leave you with. Um, I'm really looking forward to your responses this week, and I hope you all are well, and um, we'll talk again soon.